right, super, super, super. <clears throat> I was going to put this hat on and this, my DEF CON and Carolina CON, one of my shirts, and my Google Glass, just so I would be cool. Uh, later, you'll see kind of uh, how that comes into play as a joke. But uh, if you want to see this slide deck as we're talking, this is the URL here. So at this web page at the very bottom, it'll show the Carolina Con times I've spoken, and it'll show this slide deck here. All right. Let's see if we can. There we go. So, you know, what does this talk about? Uh, it's about coding on the weekend, right? So there's two open source projects. And there's two related users groups that you may not know or here in RTP. Uh, I started a Google Cloud Platform users group in 2018. I'm sponsored by Google. Uh, and I, in 2020, I believe, I started an AWS user group program. I'm sponsored there by their community builders and their user group leaders. So I have some tie-ins with AWS and GCP. And this is an open source project that utilizes both. And there's two implementations. We'll talk more about it. See if we can advance the slide. So uh, the two user groups are not kind of like uh, your normal user group. I'm, you know, where you, you meet once a month and you have a presentation. Uh, this is more of an active uh, workshop approach. We meet every weekend um, and it gets a little tight to meet every weekend, but definitely there are two advertised uh, user groups that meet for workshops and I segregate those into uh, GCP focused and AWS focused. That way that keeps my sponsors happy. Um, I do have, and that, that goes, I used to be on Meetup. I used to meet in person. Um, I really, you know, I had some attendance, but in reality, most of it is just easier because I want to do it rather than driving and maybe one or two people show up, just do it online. <clears throat> With that said, there are some periodic talks that I will do, uh, in person. Um, I would do this one in person if it was in person. Uh, the last one I did in person was at UNC last October, November timeframe. Um, and then before that, I did one over at uh, the Frontier in RTP, if you're familiar with that. Uh, so what is this talk specifically about? So <clears throat> besides trying to drive membership to the users groups, I'm trying to get people to work on the open source projects. Uh, originally it got started as a entry for a dev post hackathon. I'm not sure if you're familiar with those, but, uh, they, they run all the time. This was my second, uh, entry. I did one before, uh, with, uh, Jim Gray of Greenstream, uh, and that was part of our GCP user group. Uh, this was in response to using AWS with SageMaker for disaster response. Uh, later, because it was deep learning, I entered it into the deep learning challenge. And there you had to use EC2s and Intel. Uh, I didn't really use the EC2s, um, but I did it just enough to say it is EC2. I try to be more micro uh, services oriented. Later, I did a GCP implementation. I, and I'm saying here without sponsorship, if you go in and you do these uh, above AWS, they'll give you credits. So you'll get like about $500 uh, to cover costs. GCP didn't give me anything, but I am part of their users group. So, or developer group, I should say. So, uh, you know, why do a hackathon? Uh, you know, why come to a conference like this and do CTFs? It's kind of fun. So, however, at this particular time, I was in between jobs and rather than looking for a job, I was like, hey, let's just go out and do some work. 
and we'll use that as a talking point while I'm looking for a job. You know, it just the can get that way. Um, it's also uh, something interesting to do. I've I had been doing the user group before this time, and I have a firm belief in mastery. And I'm not, and I'm not sure if, if you're familiar with this term, but there is an expression of, you know, it takes a thousand hours or 10,000 hours to master a, a skill. Uh, I definitely believe that, you know, you start off, you don't really know what's going on. You gotta have a beginner's mindset and you just keep at it and things will become better, but you've got to exercise the skill. And the way to exercise the skill is by doing it. And that's why it's a weekly basis. And, and you, you know, in actuality, I have a Saturday morning workshop that I don't advertise, but that's really like, you know, if you're coming to the Sunday meeting, I'll give you the URL and, and you can come to that one as well. So, so what does the project do? Well, <clears throat> I had been, you know, I'm from the mountains of North Carolina. I worked up north and I'm familiar with bridges and icing and how dangerous they can be. And I also, you know, a little bit familiar with image processing, a little bit familiar with ML. And I was like, you know, maybe there's an automated way that we could see the uh, detect if the bridges are icy and maybe put it in conjunction with the temperature, uh, wind speed, and a visual. And we can kind of put this together and kind of get like a voting schedule, right? You know, this thing has a high probability. This task has a high probability. This has probably like, you know, two out of three are positive and maybe one, like it's got to be a certain temperature. Uh, we throw that one in as a minimum requirement, then we can kind of like say, yes, it's a good chance this is going to have ice on this bridge. While I was doing this, sadly, this happened on one of the bridges that I was monitoring, and this was the camera angle that I captured. So <clears throat> with that said, I'm using the NCDOT, Department of Transportation, cameras. These are public cameras that are out. Um, originally I wanted to get a camera that was fixed on a location and I'm going to talk a little bit about how that went through trying to get the cameras. So uh, does this thing work? No, no it doesn't work. There, there's a lot to do but uh, you know I'm not really that's not really my worry. My my worry is it's a goal and we're trying to get to it. If if it was working, then I wouldn't need volunteers. Uh, you know, I, so you could be the person that helps come in and help get it to work. So, you know, then this is kind of like this, I'm trying to put these oh, oh really uh, book covers in here for fun. Uh, the one with the Google Glass here, I literally had my Google Glass and I just don't can't find it, but I was like a Google Glass and a DEF CON hat, that would be, maybe you get a kick out of it. Uh, also, so maybe you're familiar with the IPS, Infrastructure Platform Software as a Service uh, versus on-premise. You know, I'm a firm believer in trying to get over here all the way to the right. Um, I've been doing Linux before Linux was cool back when Linux was a pre 1.0 kernel and I, and I love Linux, uh, but I see the cloud where they're, they're managing things and you're just buying time on it as beneficial. So, you know, I, I'm trying to avoid like AWS EC2 or GCP compute engines, which are over here and I'm trying to move to the right. So I have aspects of Beanstalk and App Engine. Lambda cloud functions, there's recognition, there's auto ML, yada, yada, yada. But, you know, they have some problems and so you've got to come back uh, to the left a little. <laughs> the next thing is when I'm doing this, I'm trying to make, trying to use lightweight, lightweight frameworks. Like there isn't any jQuery, there isn't any React. Um, I'm trying to do things as simple as possible. 
I think that also by doing things simple and using fundamentals, it increases your skill level and it's more applicable to wherever or whatever you're going to do next, right? Um, so one of the, the next thing is I'm trying to make everything open source. For instance, if you look at the GitHub repos for this work, it's all out there. There's there's nothing that's not on that public GitHub that's not been implemented. The three websites that I run, the skink.net, the uh, rtpgcp.org, and the rtpaws.org, you can go look at the website. You can go to that GitHub and, and hey, my login keys are out there. They're encrypted. There's a honeypot as well encrypted, but they're there. I, the way I see it, like, uh, Let's put it out, and it also kind of makes a challenge, and that's the security aspect. If you're making this completely open source where people can use it and collaborate, can you still maintain the security aspect? And that's part of, uh, you know, the challenge, right? Uh, I did have one time when I, I put out a, an API key by mistake, um, and I got the alert. And then I went back into the Git history and I reversed it. I removed that. Uh, I, that's, you know, it's a mistake, but it's recoverable. It would be grand if we had somebody to, to, to you know, have, join these workshops and accompany me and say, yo, dude, uh, you're about to commit an API uh, there. Uh, one of the other things talking about front end work, trying to utilize um, with JavaScript, the concept of relays. So you've got API keys that are used, but you don't want them to be able to somebody hit a browser and, and get that API key and use developer's console to find it. So you've got that aspect as well. I, I, you know, it, it's a, it's a tough problem. And there's a lot of moving parts, but there's a lot of different ways people can get involved. Okay, so you know, so what works and what fails, right? I mean, that's you probably that's interesting. So, let's. I'm going to talk about AWS because that was like the first implementation, and that worked to a certain degree. And then uh, GCP is kind of like the current focus. I'm, I'm still trying to do them both in parallel, but I pretty much re. I took down everything that I had with GCP because it was getting kind of crusty and I just reflowed it and separated things into projects. And that was what I kind of did at the beginning of the year. And now I'm kind of like doing that with AWS the same way. <clears throat> uh, so I'm just looking at AWS and, and uh, focus. Uh, I think it's the project is well documented. I think it's ready for contributors. The front end works to a degree. Um, I did a lot of stuff with recognition at the beginning and part, trying to use recognition. They have a, um, uh, they have them like the mechanical Turk stuff where you put up a bunch of images and then you log in and you say, Hey, I'm going to, label these images. I'm going to do object detection on the images. And you can put that out as a pool to say, hey, let's get 10 volunteers and let, you know, volunteer one do set of images one and volunteer two do the next set of images. And you can kind of like crowdsource the development. Um, that didn't go as well as I thought. I think a lot of people have a hard time understanding the difference in what you you know you're trying to do in, in labeling images. Um, one is you know there's different types, right? You have just a label, like does this image have a picture of a bridge in it, or object identification? This is the bridge. This is the area of interest that we're going to work on for image processing, and then you have image segmentation which is something that I don't do now, but I need to do. I think that's going to work better than the object identification. And that's where you'll like highlight all the pixels of the bridge, highlight all the pixels, a different color of say the roadway. And, and that's a whole other thing. It takes a little more to do, but uh, that would be part of it. 
Uh, so, you know, like there's a, also because this was a hackathon, you had to have a front end. So you had to have something that the judges could go to a web URL and they could point and click and do stuff. I think they were trying to weed out the people that were just making a SageMaker notebook, like a high school science fair project. And, you know, here's our canned data, click through these cells and you get a result. I think they were really trying to get people that developed the, the algorithms with SageMaker, but had wrapped it in a front end for like a production environment. Um, when I, for the actual ML stuff, there, there's not a lot. I've, I've taken a class and I've spent some time with MXNet. MXNet is from Apache. It's a competitor to TensorFlow. I've done more TensorFlow than MXNet. But I wanted to use that because that was kind of like the AWS du jour. When I took the MXNet class, it was literally computer vision on AWS. Um, with that said, it's not 100% secure. I'm not, I'm not going to tell you how to, to hack it, but there is some things there that I didn't know now. I, I knew when I was doing them, they weren't good, good practice. And I was like, I'll just hide it. Uh, but now it's, it's, it's disabled. And what I will do is when I do it the next time, I'm going to try to put this proxy in place. Um, the, the first ML prototypes failed miserably because <clears throat> when you're using recognition, cause I'm trying to, like I said, trying to do stuff as quickly as possible. Recognition really depends upon bounding boxes that are rectangular. So the camera angles are not determined by me. I'm getting whatever the public camera angle is. So one day a camera for a particular bridge might be looking at the bridge, showing the bridge scene between the bridge and the roadway. Five minutes later, it could be panned and looking at, not even at the bridge, it's looking at another roadway. So trying to get that to work and then when it does look at the roadway, the bridge is skewed. So it's kind of like a rect. It's like a, it's not a rectangular shape. It's more of a diagonal polygon type thing. And so when you try to identify where the bridge is, it's changing all the time. So that was part of my problem. Uh, <clears throat> so what works on GCP? Well. Not a lot because we just started in January doing the GCP after the new year. And like I said, the first thing we did was we were like, let's tear all this down and bring it back up. The web page is there. The sample app engines are there. They're in separate projects. The kill switch is in there and it's, it works. I think pretty good. Um, the showing how to, to develop web apps, not just on my Linux terminal here, but using the GitHub code spaces, which are basically Docker images to do Node.js, that's there. Um, we're, when we left off of it last time, it was trying to get Firebase inside of a Node app to work. And we're, we're not, like I said, Firebase seems to be out of the box working with React and React back uh, frameworks. I think the other one is like Vue, Open Vue or something. Um, I still want to stay with Express. Express is much simpler and smaller, but I haven't figured that part out yet. Still under construction. Uh, so, so what is a kill switch? Well, a kill switch is... Uh, Let's say that something happens by mistake. You leave a service on and that service is running up cost, right? I was actually going to um, put a graphic of, hey, you left your ML prediction service on overnight. And now you get this big bill. I, I, there was a meme on that. Um, also, it could be like maybe some hacker comes in and he just starts, uh, for whatever reason, hitting the website and the website uh, because it run it you generates costs by how much storage there is and how much access how many bytes are transferred maybe it starts running up i i pay for all this out of my pocket 
when I say that Google and Amazon sponsors me, let me let me make that a little bit more clear. AWS will give out some credits the, as part of the programs. The Google developer groups are really centered around Android, Flutter, things like that. They do have cloud users groups. And I have submitted requests. I haven't gotten any money yet, but one of these days I think it's going to happen. I pay for all this out of my pocket. Uh, I'm not a 503C, so I can't even write it off as a tax expense. So, it, so cost is very important to me. Um, but I also feel like if I'm doing it for a service, I'm, I'm giving it back to you, the developer, to come in here and use it to learn how to do something. And it's and I and you know and I feel good about that. So I'd like to help you in that regard. But there could be someone that comes out and they want to abuse that. And if they do, I want to be able to shut things off without me having to look at an email. Like you know, my my phone has the emails. I've got the apps. I've got the notifications. But let's say it happens while I'm sleeping, I want this kill switch to cut things off, and I want it to cut things off by segments. Like if the website's not having an issue, but a web app is having an issue, I want the web app to be killed off, right? You know, not everything. Um, so the GCP kill switch is a little different from AWS. In GCP, you have the concept of projects. Uh, they don't have that in AWS, so it's a little different. Let's go. Maybe I got a slide on that. Yeah. So at AWS, uh, you remove public access for storage buckets. You can throttle services. You can finally disable services. And that's a little bit different. With the GCP, I can just say shut down a whole project and everything associated with that project just goes offline. So uh, <clears throat> looking again at the AWS, how is it built, right? So I, so I mentioned I'm trying to do everything with microservices. If you're, I, I hope you're familiar with microservices. If you're not, I'm looking at the chat, just let me know. But a, a microservice would be something like, instead of me running a web page with a web app in the background on a EC2, I'm going to run an elastic beanstalk and it's basically going to be a no JavaScript app that uses Express and Browserify. Um, there, you know, instead of making a REST API, once again, putting it on EC2 instance and hosting it that way, I'm trying to use Lambdas and API Gateway. Uh, some of that is in Python. Uh, I, you know, I, I'm trying to use you know, the lingua franklis of the net, uh, JavaScript and Python. Uh, I would like to go to something like Go, but, you know, let's, let's go with what people know. Uh, just to keep some things simple, uh, some of it uh, runs on my local PC because I can, just, I can run it here uh, with a cron job and it's free. I don't have to put it on EC2 instance, but it's trivial stuff, right? You're just using cron to say, go out a certain time of day. I, you, it ain't going to do any good to do it at night, right? The cameras aren't night vision. And just run bash scripts that use curl to get the images, and we can collect all these images and use that as our training data. Uh, the image processing is via MXNet, like I was saying. Uh, image, la uh, image labeling is SageMaker Ground Truth, which is part of the ML recognition stuff. And recognition is their vision API for doing microservice computer vision models and prediction. Uh, so finally, so after we've talked all about all that stuff, let's talk about the project and what does it do. I like these, uh, by the way, I like these uh, uh, oh really things. I throw them in here a couple times. <coughs> so the project goal architecture is something like this. I, we're going to build front-end web apps that 
they have DNS entries for them. So this would be like minimum viable product, release candidate one, release candidate two, uh, so on and so forth. We're going to use the uh, cameras with, with the ground truth to do classification. We're going to upload images. Uh, we're going to detect where the bridge seam is or the ice, label those. Uh, and then we're going to try to do like uh, orient the things so that they're in the correct orientation. Uh, it's harder to, like I said, to label if it's a diagonal, right? You try to make them so they're right angles. And then once we, the goal is once we get a collection of images that are at, that are oriented correctly, we can say like, oh, this image is the similar image from what we had at a baseline and we can do diffs and then we can just compare the diffs and, or, and maybe even apply that to an ML algorithm. You may not even have to, you may just be able to just to say, what's the change in it? <clears throat> so, I, I mentioned some of this. Uh, one of the things that you know, when I started this was, I was familiar with the public webcams on WRL.com, which is a local TV station that has a web page. I, uh, I thought, I, you know, from doing some work with a, a company where we worked with uh, the FEMA, uh, North Carolina Emergency Management, not the federal, so it's like North Carolina EMA or something. I thought I could use those guys to help me get in touch with the NCDOT. Um, you know, I, I wrote to some of my connections. I made new connections via LinkedIn. I spoke to friends. I, I wrote to the NCDOT. I wrote to the governor, lieutenant governor, uh, just various people. To sent emails to TV stations. Like the, um, spoke to some friends. Like I. I have some friends that, uh, like one neighbor worked for the federal government, the other neighbor works for the sheriff's department, talking to them, see if they could get me some kind of contact to say, hey, on, on these webcams, do you have any webcams that are fixed? They're like, they're looking, it's a high res picture, it's fixed and it's not moving on a bridge scene. I, everything I was doing was just going into a black hole. However, while trying to find the contacts, I found this drivenc.gov website. That's actually the website that you can go to as a public and you can see those webcams. Based upon the webcams, you could at least uh, get the image. Uh, you could web scrape it. And then as part of that, trying to get in touch with those guys to see if I could get a contact. Finally, uh, it became apparent they don't have any fixed cameras. Um, they're purposely meant to move about. And eventually I got a response where the response said, I'll put you in touch with a, uh, a professional engineer. He's an engineer, right? He's a civil engineer. But those cameras are not really run by the NCDOT. They're run by a contracting firm. They, it's a private company. They're doing the work on the NCDOT as part of a government contract. But I still have those contacts, so that's good. Um, and we'll try to, you know, as we get better along, maybe we'll be able to get more traction with those guys to get fixed camera images later. Uh, so before I started doing this, you know, what did I know before I was doing it, right? So, um, I had some DSP in school. I am an electrical engineer. Uh, I'm familiar with 1D convolution since way back when. I've had some classes in image processing. And by the way, I'm not telling you this trying to brag about how clever I am. I'm trying to, t trying to, sh to show you that I do have some insight. I'm not an expert, uh, you know. I'm trying to have an, a beginner's mindset and I'm trying to say like, I'm, you know, I'm serious about this and I'm trying to do it. Right. So, um, you know, I'm hoping that might lead some credit credence to you to, to assist. 
I've, I've done some a lot of stuff with TensorFlow and MATLAB. It was mostly audio, but it wasn't video. Um, so I'm trying to increase my game as well, and I thought this would be a an interesting project to do. Uh, what was unknown before starting? Well, I mean, I had, from the user groups, I had some experience with the different microservices. Um, as you know, like I said, Google, they they don't give me cash to fund a a Google Cloud project, but they do give periodically each quarter they have kind of a campaign to say, hey, this quarter we're, we're giving out credits on Google Cloud Platform classes to take uh, these particular components you know, forward in the marketplace, trying to gain market share. So you, you know, if you came to my workshops, I could say, hey, you know, next month we're going to give out credits for these labs that are uh, on, I don't know, um, um, NLP processing maybe, or uh, Firebase. And you could take those classes using that environment and you could do it for free. And that's the best way to learn, right? You're using resources on the cloud, but it's not costing anything. So a little bit of that I had. Um, and these are mostly through these classes. AWS, <clears throat> they do something similar, but there they give you credits to use with Cloud Guru, which I think is now, we used to be called Linux Academy, now it's Cloud Guru, change names. And you can take those classes that you, once again, they set you up in an environment and, you know, you do things. But it's one thing to be going through a class and a step-by-step -step lab where they're like saying, you know, do this, do this, do this, and you get it complete. You'll learn at a level, but it's another level to try to implement something yourself. Uh, but, I, you know, some things I had, didn't know anything at all. I didn't know anything about API Gateway. Right? So I didn't know nothing about that. I knew about REST API, but I didn't know how to implement it using that microservice. <clears throat> I mentioned the drive in C.gov. This website, you can go, and like I'm, I'm highlighted Durham County right now, you can see all the cameras that are out. They're mostly on interstates, but uh, you can click on the camera and you can see what it's looking at at that particular time. Um, so basically that's, you know, I, I went around and looked in this area and in the mountains trying to get cameras that were looking at a bridge and they were high res. These cameras vary in quality. Some of them actually have text overlays on them as well. So, I mean, and sometimes the cameras, I think I'll get back to that. Well, I'll get back to the cameras here in a bit. So, uh, why the emphasis on the front end? Well, we're trying to, to get something working. It was a hackathon requirement, but uh, also it's just interest, right? Like I have an interest in using the cloud for the whole thing. Uh, the second is not everybody has an interest in computer vision. If I'm trying to recruit people I, I, to help me, some people, they might be interested in the computer vision but the computer vision, maybe, you know, we don't have enough of it there that they're interested in. Some of them may be interested in the front end portion, but they don't really know how to do anything front end. I, I literally had a lot of people like, I'll help you with the website. And what they were wanting to do was like put up a WordPress site. I mean, that's not, not really in my vision. Also, you know, if you have a front end, it, it, you have something that people can point and click, you can point them to it and they like it, right? You know, and it, it just kind of helps to recruit people. <clears throat> so along the way, I found this. Let's see what this is. And then let's go down. Oh yeah, so it's not presenting when I do that. Okay. Well, so what it is, is it's a, 
By the way, it, when I'm looking at this, I'm my slide deck is advancing. Is your slide deck not advancing? Or I, when I'm looking over here in chat, is your slide deck anybody out there? Can you chat? Is the slide deck not there? Maybe. So we've been talking this entire time. Nobody said anything. Okay. All right. <clears throat> All right. So anyway, this this link. If I do this, it'll for whatever reason it's not showing it. Uh, this is a uh, link that uh, has to do with some researchers, some college researchers, uh, university, whatever, and they were talking about how you don't actually have to be freezing uh, to have ice on the roadway simply because. Oh, it has been. Okay, thank you, Ocean. I appreciate it. Okay, you've been able to hear me? Have you not been able to see the slides? Were they not advancing? Uh, when I looked over here on Discord, it was like the first slide and said we've paused this. All right. Okay, we'll just assume it's going now because now I see it coming over. All right. All right, so... One. Okay, good. Groovy. Thank you, Ocean. I appreciate it, Ocean. Uh, so the possible architecture was what we were going to do was to take an image. This will be from the public camera. Yeah, Bueller, Bueller. Bueller. Uh, you know, do a label detection and try to see if it was a good visibility on the, the sample image. One of the things I was trying to say earlier was when you're looking at those cameras, it could be a camera that's not even looking at a bridge at the at the moment. It could be a camera that the light levels are too low. Like, you know, I'm trying to go from dusk till dawn to get the the images for my training data, but some of them, you know, because of you're you're too early, right? Or the sun you know, there, there's a there's no sun, there's no clouds and there's sun glare, right? The camera can't really see anything because there's, you know, you, you got like the the diamond effect in the lens. Um, sometimes it could have moisture on it. The camera could could be literally like fogged with uh, precipitation. Sometimes it could just have water droplets. So you're trying to, you know, say, is this a good image? This is one aspect. Then, you know, there's label detection, like, is there a bridge? We, you know, we don't want to be looking at images that we know 100% there's no bridge there. And then if there is a bridge in the picture, we want to identify the bounding box for where in the image the bridge is, right? And specifically, what I'm trying to do is get that seam. Uh, with that, you need to kind of rotate it, right? So, you know, if the and the angle is like this, these things work better when they're like so. Rotate it, turn it into a grayscale, uh, edge detection, etc. Classify it, and then also look at the weather. Is the, you know, do you meet certain temperature considerations? And then you can give out an indicator. And so this is kind of like what I had in my mind for how we're going to do this. All right, so here is a, a sample camera from one of the images I had. Uh, this one does have like the identifier, but it's all down here. Sometimes these indicators will be overlaid up here, right? And this is a particular bridge that on a normal day, right through here, you would see the change between asphalt and concrete, and you would see a seam. It's a pretty trivial guess that if you don't see this seam going here, there's ice or snow over it, right? Um, that's kind of trivial. Uh, <clears throat> the way that I scraped these cameras was I basically just, you know, found the web page, used the Chrome developer tools, uh, they they had some course protection, but you know try to work around that uh, as far as fetching the images. Um, once I had that done enough, I could you know literally like with Chrome Developer Tools, you can like highlight something and say, give me the 
the fetch uh, command via curl, right? Uh, get a cron script, uh, change the update period. Like some of these cameras, they're still in, okay, they're all still images. They're not live, right? But they all have a varying update period. So this camera might be every five minutes, he shows an image. Another camera might be every 10 minutes, it shows an image. But, you know, kind of come down to the lowest common denominator so that we weren't getting dupes and just try to get them every 10 minutes, right? Uh, while I was doing it, the API changed like three times. So three times I had to go in and change my web scraping method. Uh, currently, I know that if you go to the web page and you say, you pick a particular camera, some of the cameras work, some of them don't. And I suspect they've had another change. Uh, I, I mentioned I finally made an NCDOT contact and that led to an NCO engineering contact. And so maybe in the future, we'll be able to say like, can you please get like, this is a good camera. Can you hold it fixed and not be panning over to this roadway or train station below you? <clears throat> yeah, so I, I talked about this. The camera angles are not fixed. Um, some, yeah, I, I forgot to mention, sometimes the cameras will just go offline. Like, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe they're down for maintenance. Maybe there's some sort of problem, but literally, like, there's, there's no image whatsoever. Uh, so, with this, like, you know, what are we going to do next? Are we going to, like, perform some detailed analysis and write a paper? Or are we going to build a series of models? Uh, are we going to try and test? What are, you know, what are we going to do? I went with, you know, I guess maybe the second and the third. Let's do something, uh, not get analysis paralysis, and let's start throwing up MVPs. I'm a firm believer in agile development, and that's that's the goal. So, approach zero was like, you know, is there a difference in the edges, right? Assuming the camera angle's fixed, you have a reference image, uh, quantify change based upon the difference in pixel values, and you can put in some weather conditions. And that would be something like this, right? You know, here's a reference image, here's the edge, Here's that same with some snow. Here is the edge. And is there a difference, right? And if there is a difference, that means that, you know, in one, there was a, a bridge with seams. and the other one, there's not. I, I'm not going to try to click on that so it works. But there was a something with that. That, that may be a, I don't know what the URL, maybe like a collab notebook or something. And that's just, that's just image processing, right? There's no ML in that. Uh, approach one was like a bounding box comparison. So once again, you know, locate the seam bounding box, perform an IOU. If it's, you know, if it's the out, then there's no ice. And assume ice when the seam is visible. This is intersection of union. And so here is a tilted image, right? And there's that seam. Uh, locate the bridge, crop the image, locate the seam, and then just look at this piece. Um, so that's kind of like the next one. Uh, there was a guy that uh, was a friend of mine that I, I met via LinkedIn, um, and he's come to a couple of the workshops. He was talking about uh, pixel intensities and uh, some stuff. I, you know, more of the image processing guy. Uh, there was another paper that mentioned wavelets and stuff. And, you know, looking them out. Yet another paper requiring weather data. I am currently not scraping any weather data. I am familiar with uh, with what I think it's the underground weather weather underground. And I think it's Weather Map API is another open source one. Uh, 
so what happened when I was labeling images? So once I understood that recognition only returns bounding boxes, so like you, you could use the API for recognition in two ways. You could use it like the default out of the box, but it didn't do bounding boxes. It only did labels for the images. If you use custom labels, you could do bounding boxes. So it was like, oh, well, uh, I'm going to have to go out and start labeling some images with bounding boxes. And then I could use that as a input to recognition. So I did this, right? I was like, I, you know, I'm going to try to draw all these bounding boxes showing ice on a, on an image that I had captured. And even though it's not a bridge, I was like, really at this point in time, I was like, Oh, I just, you know, capture ice and I can see ice anywhere. Uh, problem is this doesn't work very well. There's, there's too many bounding boxes to be seen and too many of the bounding boxes look like these stripes in the roadway. So, uh, you know, one is you can't put this many bounding boxes Two, if you don't put the bounding boxes and you have regions that don't have a bounding box, then it gets confused. And if the bounding boxes are not in a, in a rectangular orientation, you're not capturing the points of interest. So this didn't work, right? So <clears throat> at that point, I was like, well, let's make this a little simpler, right? Let's, let's simplify the problem. Rather than any particular camera that's possible, let's look at cameras that are high quality. Chances are they, you know, we're just going to use canned images. We're not going to go live. And we're going to look at images that are of reasonable quality. And we have on a on the particular snow day, this was back in 22. We didn't have any snow this last year. Uh look at those days to see like we have something before and after or before during and after and so these were the camera names that i picked as higher quality and then looking at them so here is an example of one that's nearby real high quality right it's a very high quality camera but on the two snow days it happened to be looking at the road and only on one of the days before it snowed, it had uh, some portion was of the bridge and some portion was of the road. So, you know, you're trying, so I'm you know, really, I'm still gathering data and I was hoping to turn this stuff on for snow days this year, but we didn't have them. Uh, you know, the, the, what this attempt does is to reduce problem, right? You know, you only use one camera, even if it has bad images. Uh, without labeled the three things I was trying, the result was still bad. Uh, so one of the things I said was, we've got to get these images rotated. And I kind of set the front end work away, you know, for a while, set that aside. And I went back to MX Network. Um, with MXNet, you know, I could load the images. I had, you know, previous work for there. I had work with making them grayscale. But trying to do the rotate was a little hard. <laughs> then after I actually got that working, I found this I am ro rotate command. It was kind of funny. Anyway, so here is trying to rotate images to, like I said, get them in a rectangular shape. So you could draw right here a bounding box on that seam and you could compare it. Um, problem was sometimes you come through and there just wasn't enough context, right? You know, th this one is rotated, but it's not rotated at the same angle. This one's rotated and if I if I rotated that image the same angle, this guy is still not the same. So we had a problem there. Uh, 
trying to do it where I kept, I didn't go to grayscale. Uh, that actually also had terrible results. It didn't improve the model. I think the demos are now currently turned off. Uh, but, uh, so, anyway. so, you know, so what now? Well, you know, that's the reason for this talk. Uh, the talk is uh, there's more to do. You can enjoy and assist. Uh, probably better ways than using recognition. Uh, recognition has an image segmentation capability. They would take a lot more longer time to label the images with segmentation, but I think it could be done. Uh, use MXNet. You know, there's more work to be done on the front end, and we've you know, and I've mentioned that. Um, so why participate? Well, you know, you learn by doing. There's a lot of different things you could learn from, right? You could you could come in on the MXNet portion. You could get on the AWS uh, GCP microservices. You can learn some JavaScript, some uh, HTML, CSS for building those pages, Node. Learn how to, you know, how to use Chrome developer tools, right? How to do Markdown. If you just want to come in and do documentation, there's a lot of stuff to do with documentation. I... Uh, I, I, I had a guy one time, he said to me, he used to come to my workshops, he was like, wow, there's a lot, you know, that's a lot of good info you have up there, but it's very disjoint and hard to follow. And I'm like, well, yeah, because every weekend I'm trying to do something and these are really my notes that I'm maintaining. I, you know, th they get reformed some, but every every week we're doing something that we, you know, there's an aspect of what we don't know about, right? So, you know, be a creator instead of a critic, I guess is what I was saying there. Um, the repo, this is the repo for AWS. I should have put the, uh, the GCP repo up there. And I think that's it for 40 slides. We have 52 minutes in it. We've got three minutes. If there's any questions and I will, I'll stop sharing here. I can figure out how to stop. Stop streaming. There we go. Any questions? Comments? I'll move this over so I'm looking at the camera. Titan is typing. So if you, if you go to this website here, there, go to that website. On the project page is the link to this uh, slide deck. And on the slide deck, there's links to the, uh, the open source projects. And there's a link to the, um, the meeting. I think the slide deck has tomorrow's 10 o'clock meeting and tomorrow's 11 o'clock meeting and every week like it's like 99 percent i'm going to have the meeting on sundays 10 a.m for gcp and 11 a.m for aws um and if you're and if you come to that and you're interested i do a nine o'clock saturday morning the saturday morning it could run for an hour. It could run for two hours. It's more focused on programming, um, but the programming has to do with these things. And, you know, uh, it, it, there are user groups, right? So come in and, you know, if you want to talk about how to use Google Cloud Platform, I'm, I'm, I'll help you if I can. And if you don't have a question, you can at least attend and, you know, and try and pick it up. Oh, well, thank you. I pre I'm glad you enjoyed it, Titan. With the Joe's Cool uh, Snoopy icon. That's good. Anna Florida is typing. Anna was doing a Code for America project. And Bubba as well. I've actually been to the some of the Code for America here in Durham. Uh, thank yeah you're welcome thank you and thank you for you guys your your project your thing sounded cool too I'd like to maybe uh, collaborate some I've done some GIS stuff 
and I've used QGIS. Um, I have an interest in NLP and all that good stuff. Now, and Okjay is here. Okjay regularly attends my meetings. I'm glad to see Okjay is here. Uh, so, when I, how do I factor in weather conditions? One of the things I was looking at is that paper had a um, thing where they were talking about the temperature and the wind and the humidity, and they were saying that you actually get more ice when it's slightly less than freezing so that you get melting but the airflow causes a you know the airflow going below the bridge and above it causes it to kind of like smooth out and you and make a slicker ice um and so uh so i've got that I mean, you know a lot of right now is like front end right it's like you're trying to get the the web pages working uh charles hey this is interesting what language are you mainly using? So right now we're more focused on JavaScript. When we do the ML stuff, it'll be more Python oriented. But like I said, right now it's mostly JavaScript and we're trying to keep it simple. JavaScript, uh, CSS, not using Bootstrap or anything. Just writing your own CSS to, with, to do it. Uh, you can look at the websites, you can see all the, you can pull the source down, you can see how they are, that's that kind of goal and you can look at the little web app projects that are there. I didn't know anything about front end when I started doing this, so I'm trying to keep it simple. And JavaScript is like the lingua franca, right? Um, thanks, so, and so anyway, so I guess that's all the questions. Thank you for allowing me to talk to you guys, and thank you for showing up to Carolina Con. Carolina Con is my favorite con. Uh, I, I said I first started coming here maybe 2015 maybe no actually maybe before that I did the first one I did was when they were over in Chapel Hill at like the Holiday Inn I think that was 2007 or 6 now that I'm thinking about it, it was a long time ago thank you uh, M. Tejas I, I advertise every uh, meeting uh, on Sundays we have like a little organizer meeting and I throw in the meeting URLs for the day in the DC 919 uh, Slack channel, if you ever monitor there. And I even met once with the DC 919 back when they were meeting at the Durham County Extension Library, which is over here in RTP. I've been there a couple of times and talked, trying to gather interest and stuff. Well, thank you so much, Chris, for your talk. Um, really enjoyed John. it. Uh, <laughs> so if anybody has any later questions, uh, will they, best place to reach you just in Discord? Uh, yeah, you can contact me uh, here during the conference. I My email is, Dave, I'll send it, I'll put it up here real quick, davisjf at gmail.com. I'm pretty open and, uh, you know, like I said, absolute beginner mindset and just send me an email. Uh, no worries. I'd love to talk to you. Love to help you along your developer journey. Awesome. Thanks so much. Thank you. I'll leave the stage and uh, enjoy the conference, folks. It looks good.